we're gonna be talking about this book tonight. Um, this is a book that I wrote out of my own need. Uh, it, I was really surprised to have written it actually, and I write, wrote about that. If you were able to read the preface, or um, actually, I think it's in the introduction. You know that. What happened was I was, the, the whole story of where it really started was that I was cleaning out my son's closet. And at the time he was eight, now he's 10. And um, I was pregnant with the twins and I was homeschooling and just completely overwhelmed. And that feeling of, I think I might be ruining my kids and failing everybody, <laughs> it was so overwhelming. I was listening to Andrew Kern on my earbuds. Um, he was doing an interview with Mary Jo Tate at a homeschool convention, and they were talking about literature, and at the very end, uh, Mary Jo asked him, if you could tell a homeschool mom one thing, what would that be? And without missing a beat, Andrew said, teach from a state of rest. And I just thought that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. <laughs> this man has no idea what my actual life looks like. But I was intrigued enough to think, I need to find out what that looks like. What does he actually mean? Teach from a state of rest. None of the homeschooling moms that I know are very restful. And I am certainly not very restful. So what does this mean? So I went on this hunt or this quest to find out what would it be like to be able to teach from a state of rest? What would that look like for me, a homeschooling mom of a whole bunch of kids with all these responsibilities? And that's what I sought out. And as I was seeking it out and I was uh, writing about it on my blog, it just kind of grew into what is now Teaching from Rest, A Homeschooler's Guide to Unshakable Peace, which is put out by Classical Academic Press. So if any of you haven't grabbed it yet, you can grab it. You can go to teachingfromrest.com and you'll be able to find different places to grab your copy. It's in print. It's in an uh, ebook form. Um, we're making the audiobook right now. So it's due Thanksgiving. So pray for me because I still need to record quite a bit of it. <laughs> that will be ready soon. And then we also have some um, extra things for you. So um, there are at classicalacademicpress.com, you can get the companion. And the companion is really, is really dear to my heart because it includes four audio conversations that I had with people who were really formative for me as I was understanding this idea of what it might be to teach from rest. So I talked to Dr. Christopher Perrin, who is the publisher at Classical Academic Press, um, Andrew Kern, the one who originally inspired that first idea, uh, Brandy Vensel, who is an auxiliary member over at Ambleside Online and a friend of mine, and Cindy Rollins, who's a mother of nine, an amazing woman. And um, I chatted with all four of them, and that's in the audio companion. Oh, good. Uh, Rachel, you've enjoyed the audio conversations. I'm so glad. So you can get those are downloads, and you can also get the download for um, the companion journal, which is what this is. I printed mine out and had it bound at the school supply store. And um, I'll show you the inside of it a little bit tonight because... The whole idea behind the companion journal is, I was thinking about myself. I was thinking when I'm reading a book and I get really inspired, I think in my mind of all the things that we could do, I could do, or not even that. I just think of how much I need this message for myself. But sometimes I have a hard time making the leap from the idea behind it to what does this look like on my house on Monday morning. And so... That's where the companion journal was born. We created questions that would help you, as you're reading the book, dig out some answers for yourself. And I'll show you the inside of these pages a little bit more. Um, so there's some questions that will guide you. You can use them with a book club guy, or book study group. You can use them on your own. I just did them on my own. Um, printing them out will make a huge difference. Who just, oh, I just missed it. Yes, printing them out makes a huge difference because then you can write in there. And um, so we'll be working through this as we go along. There's some photography in there too, but lots of space for you to write and think and um, dig out the principles of teaching from rest for yourself. Because it's one thing to talk about rest and talk about teaching from rest and a whole other ball of wax to actually living it. And so we'll get into that. Actually, we're going to dig into that first section tonight. So before we do that, I have this vision, <laughs> this vision of you know, homeschooling moms everywhere being able to, having the, the courage and the confidence to teach from rest and approach every single day with unshakable peace in their homes. And I have this feeling that there's so many of us who really long for that. We long to 
delight in our kids and enjoy this homeschooling gig better more than we are. Uh, but we kind of need that message to be repeated to ourselves, right? I mean, no kidding. Um, last spring, I was on the phone with a friend telling her how stressed and overwhelmed I was about this, that, and the other thing with my homeschool. And she started quoting my book back at me and she said, you, you know, but I didn't catch it at first. She just started reading it and I was like, oh yeah. And she's like, yeah, I got it from this book. It was kind of funny. Like, we all need that message like over and over and over, right? It's so funny how much we need to hear the same things over and over. So I made you a little gift tonight. I worked on this earlier today because I thought to myself, how do we do that? How do we encourage each other to teach from rest or to at least take on the, the mantle that we've been given in a peaceful, restful way and teach as well as we can. And so I made these note cards and I'm gonna send them to you as a download. And um, let's see if I can hold them up where you can see them. They say, you are made in the image and likeness of God and you have exactly, and you have exactly what you need. It's backwards for me <laughs> to be the mother that he wants you to be. That's right, straight from the book. And um, they all come to you like this. Like a download, it's like you'll print it off on one piece of paper. I printed these off on cardstock, but you could just do them on regular paper. Paper. All you have to do is you just cut along this line right here and then fold them over there like that. So anyway, so I made those for you today and you can grab them. I made this thing. So this is like the most organized. <laughs> You're already crying. Oh Lord, I wish I could hug you. <laughs> um, you, I mean, I'm so organized tonight, right? I've never this organized on Periscope. So see if I can hold this up. This is where you can get it. Amongstlovelythings.com slash gift. I'll hold it up here so you can take a screenshot if you need to. And if you go there and uh, there's the little cameras. I love seeing those cameras in there with all the hearts when you take a screenshot. <laughs> so I'll send you that download if you head there. And um, I'll also send you a few other things too, but you'll get the download right away. And here's my vision. My hope and my vision is that we would, um, we would each send a card to another homeschooling mom who needs to know, oh, how do you screenshot on an iPhone? You hold the, this one and this one. <laughs> you hold the, um, the home key, the home button and the button on, the, on and off, the power. Is that helpful? Power button and home button. There we go. Thank you, one faithful mom. <laughs> um, I just think to myself, okay, so there's what? There's 368 of us right now on the mobile app and more on the um, desktop. So if 500 of us are here and 500 of us send one note or two notes to another homeschooling mom who needs to remember this message, that's going to make a huge difference in what the homeschooling culture looks like this week. So that's my challenge for you. And I will throw that up again at the end in case you missed it. Okay, um, a quick reminder, you can grab a book or a companion journal, anything you need to get in with the book club at teachingfromrest.com, but you don't need it. So if you don't have it, stick with us anyway and we're gonna move on and we're gonna get, um, we're gonna get you all encouraged and filled up. <laughs> so we're talking tonight about part one. Where did my book go? Here it is, <laughs> part one. Part one includes three chapters. Part one is called, Who's Well Done Are You Working For? It includes, the Cake Under the Couch, Why Your Daily Grind is Holy Ground, and Bring Your Basket. Before we can even get into that, we have to kind of think about what rest is. And this is what tripped me up when I first talked to, or no, when I, I didn't even talk to him yet, when I first uh, heard Andrew Kern talking about rest. Because I was thinking that he meant ease. Like, teach from ease. Make everything as easy as possible. And I thought, that's not realistic. I've tried that before. I have camped in that over -rela overly relaxed mode of homeschooling where I was doing the opposite of nurturing virtue in myself and my children. And so, how? what is he talking about? What does he mean by rest? So, the definition of teaching from rest, as I understand it, is that we need to know that rest comes from knowing, first of all, knowing what our real task is. Um, secondly, throwing ourselves into it completely. And then third, letting God be responsible for the miracle. So let me unpack those really quick, just briefly before we move on. So knowing who, what our, who our, what our real task is. Okay, so I don't know about you, 
but I get completely distracted trying to please other people or make myself look good or just meet expectations that are put on me by other people. So one of the things that I have noticed, and I have this uh, habit now when I talk to moms who have homeschooled, who have either finished homeschooling or who have... Um, they have older kids, maybe their oldest ones are in high school, um, maybe they've graduated all of their kids. I ask them constantly, what would you do differently? What would you do the same? If you could go back and talk to yourself and you know, be a little bird on your shoulder, what would you say? Because I know I'm going to get to that point and think, oh, Sarah, you know, I wish I could shake my shoulders and tell myself something wise. And so I ask them this all the time. And one of the things that struck me is that... Uh, one of my biggest worries is what other people think about my homeschooling, whether that be the neighbor or the superintendent who lives next door, which was an actual thing that happened for a while. We had a superintendent next door, a really nice guy, but still, I was still worried about it. Um, or whether that be my mom or whether that be the, you know, my sister or whether that be the state, um, board or the school district or whatever. I worry about yeah, your public school teacher sister-in-law, exactly, or worried about whatever people think of me. And the funny thing about homeschooling is that, um, how do I say this? When our children don't behave perfectly well, a lot of times people immediately point to homeschooling, right? They say like, oh, that's because you're homeschooling. So if they were in school, that would not be, oh, that's because they go to public school. But that, but that's what happens to us as homeschoolers. And so I, I would feel this overly sensitive burden of trying to please other people, even trying to please my children, trying to please anybody, even myself. How do I homeschool in a way that makes me look really, really good? Um, and what struck me when I talked to these homeschooling moms who had, you know, done this for a long time is they never say, you know what I wish? I wish I'd really impressed that neighbor that we used to live next to back when we lived on Park Avenue in 1995. College admission people. Perfect. Exactly. Those are exactly the kind of people we're all worried about impressing. And what struck me is when I was thinking about rest and thinking about teaching our kids and what these experienced moms say is that they never worry, they never at that point from that perspective, way down the road, look back and wish they had impressed more people in their life. We have one master. Yes, one master, one person we're trying to please. And when we forget that, we lose sight of the whole thing we're supposed to be doing. We are educating our children, which means we are growing them. We are raising them in virtue. Our whole intent for homeschooling our kids or educating our kids is to cultivate in our children wisdom and virtue to the glory of God. And we completely forget about that when we get mixed up and forget who our real master is. So that's the first part is knowing our true task. And the second part is throwing ourselves in completely. Okay, and this is what I missed for the first several years of homeschooling. And in this book is the first time I talked about those years where I parked in that overly relaxed mode of homeschooling. Uh, like, well, we'll talk about this later, the difference between, um, or that rest is in between the vices of negligence and anxiety. So we'll talk about that. But I was definitely swinging toward negligence. Kind of this idea that my kids would just, they should never be forced to learn anything that they weren't interested in themselves. I needed to follow their lead. I should. I used the word manipulate a lot when I was thinking about teaching my kids. So I would think I can't manipulate them into learning things they shouldn't learn. And it's silly to me now when I think about it, but that's where I was. And, um, where was I going with that? Oh, so I, that's where I missed the boat. I missed the boat about, I had gotten a hold of this idea that I wasn't supposed to be trying to please college admissions officers or the state board or my mother-in-law or whatever. I'm supposed to be pleasing God, but I forgot this important piece. And that is, uh, well, it's best illustrated in the story of feeding the 5,000 in the Bible. And I do talk about this in the book. And how it really, really strikes me that when Jesus is going to feed the 5,000, he could have made the bread and loaves. He didn't need the bread. I mean, the fish and the bread. He didn't need it, right? He could have fed 5,000 out of nothing. He could have fed enough and had overflowing baskets for nothing. But he asked them to bring what they had. 
everything they had and give it all to him. And that is what he used to feed the 5,000. And so what strikes me about that is that that is my job. I'm supposed to bring my basket, everything that I have. And I'm not responsible for the miracle, but I'm responsible to bring it all to him and let him work the miracle, which brings us right to the last part of teaching from rest, which is letting God be responsible for the miracle. He didn't ask me to turn my loaves and fish into f food for the multitude. He didn't, even though it feels like that sometimes <laughs> on Monday morning when I have six hungry kids and I think <laughs> they're like my, you know, mountainside of people to feed. And I have uh, this measly little basket of almost nothing, right? He didn't ask me to turn water into wine. Let's, we can go back to that story of the wedding of Cana where he could have filled those pitchers from nothing with wine, but he asked them, fill the pitchers brimful of water. That's what we do. We bring our basket, we fill our pitcher, we bring everything we have. So first we remember what we're doing, cultivating wisdom and virtue in our children, who we're doing it for is God, that we have to go all in and bring our basket or fill our pitchers, whatever metaphor you wanna use, and then remember that he is responsible for the miracle. So I was, let's turn to page three in the book, which is chapter one. And okay. And this is because I'm going to, um, I'm going to the journal and I'm going, someone said just keeps disconnecting and I'm sure it works a little bit better. Okay, so if it is me, then hopefully that's fixed now. In the journal, uh, in the companion journal, we start with these two questions. The first one is, what interruptions or existing conditions keep you from being efficient or getting more done? And so that comes from page three. And I'm gonna read a little bit of here. Okay, Cheryl says I froze. Can a couple of you just let me know if you can see me and I'm not frozen? I'll take a drink of my tea while I wait to hear from any of you. Tanya says, we're breaking the internet. Let's hoax scandals. Homeschool moms, we're breaking the internet. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Okay, good. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, so page three. Rest begins with acceptance, or perhaps more accurately, with surrender. There will always be more you can do. You will never complete your tasks entirely because just on the horizon is tomorrow, and tomorrow the to-do list starts anew. It is so exhausting, sometimes even demoralizing, to realize that our work in raising up and teaching our children is never really done. But we must remember that we were never intended to finish it. I'm gonna skip some and jump over to a quote from uh, Dom Hubert von Zeller's Holiness for Housewives and Other Working Women, which is an amazing book. He says, when a person interrupts what you are doing, you ought to recognize a representative of Christ. When the dog is seen getting under the sofa with tonight's dessert, you at once assume that God wants you to put aside the half hour you had been looking forward to, which you meant to spend with a book and church or doing the Stations of the Cross, to make another dessert. Whatever is getting in the... And then this is me. I'm, we're done with Dom Hubert von Zeller now. Whatever is getting in the way of your plan for the day, the toddler's tantrum, the messy bedroom, the sticky juice leaking all over the fridge and into the cracks of the drawers, the frustrated child, the irritable husband, the car that won't start, the cake the dog dragged under the couch, whatever that intrusion into your grand plan for the day is, it's also an opportunity to enter into rest. C.S. Lewis once observed, the great thing, if one can, is to stop regarding all the unpleasant things as interruptions of one's own or real life. The truth is, of course, that what one calls the interruptions are precisely one's real life, the life God is sending one day by day. What one calls one's real life is a phantom of one's own imagination. Okay, I love, I love that both from Zeller and from Lewis because um, I, when people, I have this grand plan for the day. Do you do this too? Let me know in the chats if you do this too. You wake up on Monday and you, I think, okay, we're gonna do this and this and this, we're gonna get this done and then we're all gonna break for lunch and then we're gonna get this done. This. And then the toddler throws up and I feel like that's an interruption. My day just got thwarted. But what he's reminding us is actually that day we planned out was a fantasy. It wasn't even reality. It was like 
it was living in our brain. But the real day, the day that we actually get grace for, is the one we're living right now. That's it. We don't get grace for this imaginary, you know, day that we have built in our head. We get grace only right when we need it, never a moment before, <laughs> right when we need it in our real actual day. So in our journal, the, and if you don't have the journal, you can just do this on a piece of scratch paper, but the first question is, what interruptions or existing conditions keep you from being efficient and getting more done? What can you do to remember that all of those interruptions come right from the hand of God? So I wrote down all the things that I usually perceive as interruptions, and I'll show you here. I've got toddlers with an exclamation point, <laughs> uh, meal prep, daily household tasks, messes, laundry, more laundry, and more, <laughs> kids who don't listen, obey, or understand, expectations from others, my own lack of self-discipline. These are all the things, actually, that one probably is a real, you know, problem. <clears throat> the lack of self-discipline, but all the other things, the toddlers, the laundry, the meal prep, if I can flip that on its head and realize that these are not actually interruptions, they're gifts to me from the hand of God in order to help me grow in virtue, that spins everything on its head. So I wrote a note to myself down here that says babies and toddlers aren't getting in the way. Babies and toddlers are the whole point. My kids grow in virtue more from loving and responding to toddlers and babies than from any prescribed lesson. Lori, the interrupted life. Yeah, that's what we live, right? So, so let's get back to that idea of what rest is. Rest living in between. It's the virtue in between negligence and anxiety. I'm a really visual person, so when I make notes in my commonplace or in my journal, I always do like really little sketches and stuff. So I've got rest in the middle here in between, it, it's the virtue in between these two vices of negligence and anxiety. And I'm asking you on this page to think about whether you're more likely to uh, fall prey to one camp or the other. Usually, most of the homeschooling moms I know tend to either when they get tired, frustrated, worn down, they tend to slip to one or the other. So, I wrote, I actually, I slipped to both for sure. I definitely slipped to one more than the other, but I slipped to both for sure. So I made a, a list of the things that are either going through my head or that I use as excuses um, when I'm falling toward negligence and when I'm falling toward anxiety. So anxious negligence. That is a perfect description, one faithful mom. Anxious negligence. <laughs> yeah, isn't that the worst? Oh my gosh. So for negligence, I put when I'm lazy, you know, when I don't feel like doing the work. Uh, I'll think things like, why does this even matter? When will these use this? When will they use this? Which has got to be the worst question for a classical educator to use for sure. Um, or when I'm over-involved in my own projects. That's when I slip to negligence. Or when I'm really tired. I didn't write that down, but it just came to me. When I'm really sleep deprived, I tend to, I tend to just think it's not that important. We can, we can, you know, slip off the radar. For anxiety, I start thinking things like, how do I compare to others? Am I failing them? What if they just don't come out right? Which is a ridiculous thing to think because just like we're not responsible for turning the bread and the fish into food for the 5,000 or water into wine, we are so also are not responsible for turning our children into the perfect kind of human beings we want them to be. That's silly. Um, or I turn into a taskmaster. The social media is what ends up stirring up anxiety in me. And sleep deprivation and, and my own lack of self-discipline is what turns me to negligence. So just a, acknowledging that these are the things that make me slip away from rest is helpful to me because then since I've thought about it and I've written it out, I start to notice it on an ordinary day. You know, I start to realize that it's, it's, I'm more likely to slip toward one of those vices. Okay. So what can you do? This is the next page I have. What do you, what can you do to keep yourself from slipping down the slope toward either negligence or anxiety? So I started thinking about this when I was writing this out. I thought, what can I do? And for me, and this is gonna be different for everybody, which is why it's really important to work this out for yourself. Um, but for me, being accountable to Andy, so when Andy's really tapped in, knows what we're doing in our homeschool, Andy's my husband, sorry, I assumed you knew that, um, uh, that helps me because I report to him or let the kids know what's going, uh, we know what he's 
what let him or the kids let him know what we've been doing. Also, homeschool co-ops are really good for us. Um, I'm, I've talked about this before. I'm very extroverted. I love homeschool co-ops. Um, they really help me be accountable because I really like to please people. And so I really like to have our homework done and things done for the teachers that, um, you know, that we've got assigned. And so homeschool co-ops actually help me um, slip from slipping into negligence. Totally not going to be the case for some people. That co going to a homeschool co-op may make you slip toward the vice of anxiety. And so it's really helpful to stop and think for you, what does negligence look like and what does anxiety look like? Okay. And then, um, so for me, reporting to my husband or to our homeschool groups are very effective safeguards. Yeah, Dawn says co-op would make her anxious. I have lots of friends who I think they say that would make them anxious too. Yeah, I think that's totally true. So it's really helpful to think for ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what helps me from slipping into anxiety? Being in the word, meditating on truth, listening to wise mentors like, and I just listed a few of my favorites, Andrew Kern and Dr. Perrin are probably my two very, very favorite you know, homeschool experts or mentors or to listen to, and they, they speak calm truth to me. So if I listen to their audio lectures or I read something they've uh, written, then it helps me remember to shed my anxiety and to stop comparing myself to the school system or the kids down the street. Um, and I didn't put this on here, but I would say even like stepping away from social media for a little bit if I need to get grounded again because I'm feeling myself get amped up. Oh, Martin Cothran. Thank you for mentioning them, Don. Yes, Martin Cothran too, for sure. Okay, so those all help me stay grounded and prevent anxiety. All right, I wanted to read another passage, and I keep putting my book down and losing it. That's so silly. I have another one back here. <laughs> this is funny. My daughter was like, why are you bringing so many books? I didn't tell her because I was going to lose them. I didn't anticipate losing them, but apparently that's what it is. Oh, Andrew Pudua. Yep, him too. <laughs> okay, page 11. Let's slip over to page 11. Or that's what I wrote down, but... Um, oh, yeah. Okay. It is easy to forget that teaching is holy work. The building up of the intellect, teaching children to really think, does not happen by the might of human reason, but rather by the grace of God. On an ordinary day, you and I likely have a set of tasks we've scheduled for our kids, but it's more than math, it's more than history, it is the building up of our children's minds and hearts, and we can only do that if we realize that this is how we thank him for the graces he so lavishly pours upon us. I tend to get lost in the details of large family life when I'm right in the midst of it. It takes a certain fortitude, after all, to look at a pile of dishes and see it as the makings of a cathedral. The daily mundane is holy ground because the ordinary tasks of a monotonous Monday are where we meet our maker. The builders of medieval cathedrals knew what it meant to work their entire lives to please God without ever expecting to see their work completed. Many cathedrals would take more than a hundred years to build, more than the span of a man's lifetime. I once heard a story of an artisan who worked tirelessly for many years to carve a beautiful bird into the wood of a portion of the cathedral that would be covered up. When someone asked why he was working so hard on something that no one would see, he replied, because God sees. God sees your little wooden bird too. Just as the artisans and carpenters of old built beautiful cathedrals for the glory of God, so do you. You, who work tirelessly day after day over a geography lesson, a math test, a laundry pile, a kitchen sink. Those are the moments wherein you build cathedrals for God. So can you think of a time when you were able to see the daily mundane as building a cathedral for God? And what could you do? to make that frame of mind a habit, because you won't stay there. You can think of it, and you can remind yourself of it, and then it turns to Tuesday, and we forget. So for me, I have noticed 
that when I take pictures or when I look at photos, well, first of all, when I look at photos of our ordinary life, when I look at photos from six months ago and I see the little babies running around half dressed, you know, in mismatching clothes with like yogurt smeared on their face, in that moment I was probably thinking, oh, don't take pictures. They don't, this is terrible. And there's laundry all over the floor and it's noisy. And I'm thinking, this is not the, this is not the picture I want, you know? Six months later, I look back and I see it and I just think very fondly of it. And I think those are beautiful children. And look at that beautiful mess. It's like a picture gives us perspective that we can't have in that moment. And so I found that even taking the pictures, the act of taking the pictures helps me step out of the chaos of that moment. So when I, on my journal, I drew a little picture of a camera and I wrote, when I look at photos of our ordinary day, or as I'm looking through the lens to take the photos, I can see the eternal importance of the otherwise mundane. And I made myself a little resolve, take more photos. I should have put in, put in. <laughs> I should have said, take more messy photos because those may be my favorite. The ones that show all the glory of the cathedral building, you know, that you can't tell when you're covered in sawdust. Yes, and be in more photos, absolutely. So, let's see if I have this room there. On the next page of the journal for this part of the book, I asked, how does God want you to spend your day? So if you were aiming to please him alone, as we think about the priorities of our homeschool, and if the nitty gritty mundane details of our day are not only not, they're, they're seen by him, but also they're building something far more beautiful than we could ever possibly envision, then what should we teach and how can we teach it? And this is kind of one of those philosophical questions, but when I sat with this one for a little while, I kept coming back to something Andrew Kern has told me time and time and time again. And he's told me, focus on truth. There's AK, that's my, I always write AK when I write down an Andrew Kern quote, which happens a lot. Focus on truth. I think I'm most able to teach, discern, and lead from truth as it is presented through literature. So this is me just thinking through my own teaching style, the things that I um, have noticed in our homeschool that have made the most lasting impact are really good conversations um, that we've had around books um, or questions that we've asked around books or just stories we've shared together even if we haven't talked about them. So yeah, Don, you said that's a bit abstract. Nothing Andrew Kern says is anything except abstract, right? <laughs> but focus on truth helps me when I'm getting caught up in the minutia of my school day and I'm either getting amped up and anxious or I'm starting to let my, myself slide and get negligent. I can remember to come back and focus on truth. What's the most important thing we can do right now that will help us focus on truth? For us, that's almost always, I know you love him. <laughs> yes, every, yeah, totally. Um, for us, that looks like reading and discussing. That's priority number one. And so when I think about, okay, in the moment, if I am having a really hard time or our days falling apart, what can I possibly do Practically speaking, so let's get out of the philosophy for a second and really practically speaking, what can I do that would help me focus on truth and help my children focus on truth? And for me, my answer is to read and have a conversation with my kids. And so that's a good thing for me to write down. So now I'm thinking through the, the habits that I know will make me slide toward negligence or slide toward anxiety. I'm reminding myself I need to take lots of pictures so that I can remember this eternal importance of the daily stuff I'm doing. And I know that when things start to fall apart, I probably should pick up a book and read to my kids or send them all off away from me to read, which is also a really great thing to do and have a discussion later. And then on this page, I also say list several practices, practical ways you could treat your children as images of God. So big focus in the companion journal is on practical application because we can't just live in the philosophy and not put our feet on the ground and live it or we're not going to see any difference in our homeschool. So we need to list several practical ways we could treat our children as images of God rather than tasks to check off our list. Remember, we're not filling buckets. We're raising people, we're raising persons. In what ways are we trying to feed our 5,000? What's in the basket that we can offer to God? We're trying to do, how are you trying to 
feed the multitude with your loaves and fish when really you just need to give it to God. And what are some practical ways we can remind ourselves the, this really, really important truth that our children are images of God? So I listed five. I said, greet them warmly each morning. Bend down to the littles to make eye contact, you know, instead of towering above them and kind of half listening, <laughs> nodding. Give them 100% of my attention when they're talking. Uh, because I'll find myself saying, uh-huh, and flipping through Instagram while my kids are trying to talk to me, which is not a way for me to treat them like images of God. Ask them questions with the single intent of getting to know them better, not trying to make them smarter, not trying to make them better, but just to get to know them better. And put less on their checklists and just let them be more. So when you're doing this exercise, you can just think, what are some practical ways that you can... Um, Live that out day to day, feet on the ground on a hairy Tuesday when things are not going well, you're not at your best, and you're not going to be perfect, but what are some really practical things you can um, figure out to do ahead of time so that you know you can live those out a little bit better when you're in the moment. So I, um, I'm reading comments here so I don't, <laughs> I don't miss them. I want to make sure that I have a few minutes, I don't know what time it is. Oh yeah. There's me saying it'll be a 30 minute scope and then I don't, <laughs> I can't. Um, I want to know if you have any questions that you'd like me to answer. I won't be able to answer a bunch of them, but I will watch the comments here and see if I can answer any questions that you have coming up. Somebody asked earlier if Andrew Kern's on Periscope. He's not. But I am going to go see him in March, and I will get him on a Periscope if it kills me. And it won't. I'm pretty sure. Will this be a podcast? It will be a video replay. We'll put... Wow, you just did somersaults. You didn't even know that. <laughs> that was impressive. Right down on my lap. Okay. I'm just making sure I don't miss those. Um, shoot, and I just forgot the question you asked because I got all distracted by the phone falling. Oh, podcast. It won't be a podcast. It will be a video replay. You'll be able to um, get, if you go to sarahmckenzie.tv, you'll be able to watch the replay. Um, it is on catch. Uh, Marnie, it will be on catch, but we'll actually put show notes and we'll beef it up a little bit and make it easier to watch um, right there on the blog. So if you go to sarahmckenzie.tv, that's where the links will all be. And we should have it up by Thursday. How long do I feel like it took me to get to the point of teaching from rest? So here's the part that's a little discouraging <laughs> because I don't really think I've gotten there. And this is one of those things that, um, thanks Kara, thanks for putting that link in the chat there. Um, this is one of those things that I get asked, I think every time I speak somewhere, someone asks me how long is it going to take. I don't know because I haven't gotten there and most of the homeschooling moms that I've talked to who have older kids or who have graduated them don't feel like they have ever gotten there either. I think it's one of those things that's a wake up every single day, tame the beasts, fall to your knees and let grace wash over you and over time you get a little bit better at that. You get a little bit better at recognizing those beasts when they come at you like anxiety or negligence at falling to your knees a little faster when things aren't going the way they should and at just letting grace shape and change you. So I don't think it's something that you arrive at in a certain amount of time. Yeah, right. It's a daily fight for joy. Exactly. I know I missed a few questions up there. I actually saw them and I completely forgot them. So throw them back up there if you, um, if you'd like me to answer them. Oh, somebody asked about CC. So, um, I've never been in a classical conversations group. Okay. Heart of a mother. I'm going to answer that in just a second. Um, I've never been, thank you for the reminder, Krista. I've never been a part of a CC group. I know a lot of wonderfully spectacular women who use CC and love it. We love their timeline song. And so we sing and memorize the timeline song. But um, I have not used CC. I know my teaching style and I have not joined a CC group primarily because I'm not sure the pacing would allow us to teach from rest. Um, it would not allow, would allow me to teach from rest or allow me to maybe do school in the way, in the, at the pace I want to. I don't know how to describe it so well. Our homeschool year for now, um, is shaped a lot around travel and around, um, 
my husband's work schedule when he's off and I just like being kind of independent from a co-op that has quite so much to say with what we're doing at home. So, but I have looked at a lot of the CC materials. I like them a lot and I know a lot of women who like them and who have found them to be life-giving. And also I think their communities are sometimes unbeatable as far as finding good friendships and other awesome kids for your kids to play with. Um, somebody asked earlier and I can't remember, heart of a mother, I think it was you, if you want to pop that back in there. You said, how do you know, how do you trust yourself when you're choosing your homeschool, right? Um, I think it helps to surround yourself with wiser people than you so that they can help you, so that they can help you with that confidence. First of all, so they can guide you. And then secondly, when you start to kind of get your feet under, you make decisions so that they can help you, um, continue to make decisions that are going to guide you when you're going off track. So I surround myself purposefully with some women who are further down the road than I am and who are really wise. And then I also surround myself uh, just from a mentor relationship by listening to audios from homeschooling experts like Dr. Perrin and Andrew Kern and Andrew Pudua, who I think can speak life and truth and joy into my homeschool and help me understand what the most important priorities are. So I definitely listen to all of those people to see what they have to say and then pray about it. And then also just looking at your kids and seeing how they respond to the different things you present before them. I think so often we forget that our guts are pretty good. Like God gave us our guts. <laughs> My gut instincts are pretty good. So when I look at a curriculum and I think, I know they say this is supposed to be for fourth grade, but my fourth grader, I think, would cry if I gave him this. I don't give it to him. So, um, and I think that you get more confident with that. And tell me if what you guys think, if you agree with that. Um, that uh, the longer you're at homeschooling, the more confident you get that really, honestly, um, a happy and content and cheerful mother is way more important than whatever curriculum you pick. So the curriculum, is on, as far as my priority list goes, is kind of far down the list as far as what I think is going to make for a successful homeschool year. And it's way more important that my attitude is good, way more important that our schedule is doable and not causing us anxiety, way more important that my kids have adequate time to interact with other humans, <laughs> me to interact with other humans, and... Um, and have a vibrant faith life and family life. And the academics are very, very important. So don't get mistake what I'm saying. The academics are super important, but the actual curriculum, like the exact book that I choose is pretty far down the list as far as, I honestly think you could probably do well with almost anything that's on the market if you just did it cheerfully and consistently. Diligence over time. You know, I've seen some questions pop up about language arts curriculum or math curriculum. And I will put some links in the show notes to specific curriculum that we use. But honest to goodness, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of merit in choosing one curriculum or another if you do it cheerfully and on a consistent basis. So, yeah, it looks like there's a lot of CC people here. Yeah, so my suggestion for those of you who are interested in CC is to go to your local one and try it out and see if it feels like it'd be a good fit for you or not. You know, another reason we didn't do it is because we were already involved in a co-op that, that guides a lot of our curriculum choices for the year. So, yep. Very good. Okay. I think I probably have time for one last question. I know I've missed some, so whoever gets theirs popped in first, I'll answer. Am I scared to teach high school? No, I'm not. Um, I... I do get scared to teach high school when I live too much in my head about it because I think we have this uh, this tendency to blow it up in our head about how hard it's going to be. Um, I don't think there's something that happens all of a sudden when our kids are 14, 15, 16 that now we're suddenly not capable of seeing their needs and meeting them. Now, I am not planning to teach my kids, my high school kids, everything. In fact, my homeschooling philosophy is not at all that homeschooling means I teach my kids everything. I really believe that my job as a homeschooling mom is to cultivate wonder and curiosity in my children and help them progress from not knowing to knowing, to cultivate that virtue and wisdom in them. Sometimes I do that by teaching it myself, and sometimes I do that by outsourcing. So, for example, this year we've hired a math tutor, and if you go to sarahmckenzie.tv, I did a Periscope all about that, so you can see more about how we chose to do that and why. Um, 
And in high school, we'll definitely be doing lab science with a co-op, and I'll have a math tutor, and um, we'll seek it if I need to. I'll, I'll trade with friends um, to help us meet that goal of cultivating wonder and growing virtue in our high schoolers. I don't have to be the one to teach them everything, but I definitely think that there's a benefit I can see, at least, to next year. My oldest will be a freshman, so we haven't done high school yet. But I can see from this vantage point there being a benefit to being able to guide who's going to be teaching her and how. So I'm not scared about it because I don't feel the burden of having to do the entire thing by myself. Um, oh, good. One faithful mom says, don't let high school scare you. She's graduated three with seven to go. That's so good. <laughs> oh, you love homeschooling your high schoolers, Amy. That's really wonderful to hear. I've, I've heard that from a lot of people who have homeschooled their high schoolers. That That's when it gets really fun. Don't give them away yet. <laughs> it's fun. So I wouldn't be too excited about giving my oldest daughter away anyway. <laughs> Not that that's what you do when you put them in high school. But I'm really excited about reading the classics with her and talking about it. And then just letting her go explore and come back and, and talk to me about it. And uh, we have some vibrant people in our community, like in our, in our uh, homeschool co-op. There's a lady who just love science and she just throws her heart into science and she teaches these amazing high school science courses that everybody there says are fantastic. So those kind of things. And I think if you need help teaching high school, just reach out to your community. There are homeschoolers everywhere. So very good. Okay. I want to remind you before we go that next week, next Monday, um, uh, same time, same place, we're going to be here. We're going to be talking about part two. Can you even believe this? I seriously misplaced my book again. Are you guys seeing where I put it? <laughs> How is it possible that I'm in a two foot square? Oh, no idea. This is the weirdest thing. Oh, they're right here. Okay. They're underneath my notebook. That's why. Part two, we're going to be talking about <laughs> curriculum is not something you buy. We're going to totally get practical nitty gritty. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the philosophy and the mindset, and next week we're going to go to nitty gritty. I'm glad you all think it's funny that I misplace things. My husband is watching, I'm sure, in the other room, and he's probably rolling his eyes right now. I misplace everything. Okay, so we're going to talk about nitty gritty, what does this look like? So part two is called curriculum is not something you buy. We're going to talk about how to simplify the curriculum, how to simplify the schedule, and how to do the right thing at the right time. So same time, same place. Um, if you go to amongstlovelythings.com slash gift, I'll put this back up here in case anyone didn't get a chance to screenshot it. You'll get those note cards I was talking about. Boy, it would just like make me, my heart sing to know that all these homeschool moms are getting the encouragement they need to live out this hard life of homeschooling. That's not, that's countercultural and that's, you know, it's a refining fire. It stretches us in all the hardest ways. <laughs> So go and grab that amongstlovelythings.com slash gift. And remember um, that you can watch the replays of all this, all of these book club scopes, but also any other scopes I've done at sarahmckenzie.tv. I, <laughs> you love being countercultural. I do too, isn't it? It's like a rebellious thing inside of us, I'm thinking. <laughs> we all look like such docile homeschooling moms. We have this little rebellious streak. <laughs> you can see the card. These are the cards that you'll get, the note cards. They're just blank cards that you can use to encourage homeschooling moms around you. You'll get a printout like this, and you'll just fold it in half and slide it, or slice it up the middle and fold it in half. And they say this. You are made in the image and likeness of God, and you have exactly what you need to be the mother he wants you to be. All right. That's it. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been an absolute delight. I am so grateful for all of you being here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will see you next week.